All right. We have the baby in the background, you may hear. Baby Ben. All right. Let's get going here. We are continuing in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 10. I'm going to read through it quickly of where we left off at, and then we'll continue. We only have just a few verses left uh, in Revelation chapter 10, so that's good. So we can wrap it up and start in Revelation chapter 11. All right, so we are uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 8 uh, through 11 that we're reading so far. is giving us the seven trumpets of judgment by the seven angels, or seven trumpet judgments by seven angels. And as we said, in between the sixth and seventh uh, trumpets of judgment, there is this pause break where there is this plan of salvation or this revelation of the plan of salvation of God uh, through Christ is being revealed. Uh, and that's where we're at now. So we're in chapter, uh, chapter 10 of that. So we'll continue on. And it says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet pillars of fire. And he had, well, I just want you to know, I didn't go into all the details about these things, but the next time we go through, we'll add more details to these things about uh, the description of Christ as represented here as the angel of the Lord. It goes on verse two and it says, and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein should be time no longer. So we talked about there's going to be no more delay uh, in revealing or bringing to an end the whole plan of God. Right. And he's he's swearing to this. He's done all that he could have done that can be done. Or he is doing and will do all that is can be done. That is the Lord doing all that he can do to uphold the testimony and the covenant uh, that God has for mankind, of course, to save the world, that none should perish. Christ is doing all that he can. He's swearing, you know, by God, you know, the testimony of fulfillment of all things that God has planned through Christ Jesus. Verse seven, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he had begun to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So the mystery of God right now is not completely known or completed until judgment day, right? So there is a time where everything is going to be revealed and everything is going to be decided, right? Um, there's a bunch of scriptures. I didn't put that in there yet, but, um, but there is a time that's coming where there's going to be no more mystery or anything like that. Everything is going to be decided. Everything is going to be revealed. Everything is going to be known, right? The completion of all things is going to be wrapped up. There are different mysteries. There's lots of mysteries we talked about before. There's the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, Israel's blindness, the rapture, uh, the mystery of his will, uh, the mystery of the church uh, and Christ, uh, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of iniquity, right? The mystery of God and Christ, uh, uh, the mystery of the faith, right? Uh, the, the, the faith, uh, the mystery of godliness. There's also the mystery of the seven stars and golden lampstand, which is uh, explained to us, of course, in the book of Revelation. Uh, mystery of Babylon the Great, uh, the mystery of the harlot. So there's lots of mysteries that are in the Bible. Uh, but of course, the, the, all of that is contained within the mystery of God. Right, all of that, he's gonna, he's, everything is going to be wrapped up, exp uh, come to an end and revealed and decisions are going to be made, you know, who's on the right hand, who's on the left hand, who's the goat, you know, why did all this sin and uh, evilness go on and all that stuff is going to be finally just uh, brought to an end and wrapped up uh, and judged and things like that. Verse 8, it says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel 
which standeth upon the seas. So this is somewhat what we were talking about on last Sunday. And he says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it. And it shall be, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So that's kind of where we left off. Um, we talked about a little bit how it's important how what the angel told him was uh, what um, he was given instructions to go and take the book. We said, um, the voice told him, take the little book, which is in the hand of the angel. Of course, so we know what John said. He goes there and he says, give me the book. And the angel said, nope, you've got to take it. You must take it and you must eat it, right? And then begin to describe how it's going to make his belly bitter and in thy mouth is going to be sweet as honey. So we kind of looked at a little bit, the word little there um, is talking about a uh, little book. It means uh, biblion. It only occurs in the book of Revelation. It's talking about a smaller book or a smaller portion of scripture in the Bible, right? There's another uh, variation of that same word is biblos. That's talking about a larger book, like a complete book, like a uh, like the largest, like the largest book, like the book of the prophets, the book of Psalms, Jeremiah, those large books. That's called Biblos, right? Um, <laughs> it's just a little uh, background there. All right, so the little book that he's talking about likely pertains to uh, the book of Revelation or elements of the book of Revelation, things like that. All right, or you know this entire book here that he's on the island of Patmos, and it must be delivered uh, to all of us. Uh, notice we said before in ending it that it talked about how he was instructed to eat it, right? To eat it up, eat it up entirely, eat all of it, right? Consume it, right? And the scripture is often associated or the word of God is often associated or we're given instructions to eat the word. You know, I desire the sincere milk of the words. Always some form of ingesting of the word. So whether it be desire the sin sealed milk of the word we talked about or uh, the bread and things like that. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter three, verse one through four, we are very familiar with uh, some of these, a, a similar passage of what we just read in Revelation we find in the Old Testament, looking at Ezekiel chapter three, verse one through four, the scripture reads, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So a word is given to him and he's been told to eat it, right? Eat this roll, a roll like a book or scroll, right? Uh, he's supposed to eat it and then take it, this words to the house of Israel. And he goes on and says, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So here we see then that this process sounds very similar. This passage is very similar to what we're hearing. Uh, we're reading now in the book of Revelation uh, chapter 10. So the importance of the uh, prophecy being given by the Lord unto Ezekiel and Ezekiel to digest this, eat it up. But again, in his mouth, he said it's going to be uh, sweet as honey. Uh, in his belly, it's going to fill his bowels. He's going to fill his bowels with this, with the word here. So it's a very similar passage. Uh, we see again that the word of God is often associated with eating, uh, drinking, and things like that. When we look at John chapter 6, verse 27, verse 27 and verses 32 through 33 and 35, um, uh, Christ is speaking here, says, Labor not for the meat which perishes, perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. For the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So, of course, what Jesus is saying here is that he is uh, that meat uh, that God has given, and, and he will provide as the Word of God, the Son of God. He will provide uh, eternal life. He's that meat that will provide eternal life or everlasting life, all right? Uh, Jesus goes on to say, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So the meat, the substance that he's talking about, that meat here is the word. The pure word of God is meat. 
the son of God is meat, right? In its purest form that comes down from God in its purest, heaviest form, not like milk or anything like that, but in the pure word of God that comes down um, uh, the full embodiment of the word of God in Jesus Christ. That is the pure meat, right? That is the bread that we're talking about here. That's bread. That's, that's meat here. Um, Verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. So, of course, the bread of God which cometh down from heaven, that he here is so speaking of Christ, the word of God, the son of man, the son of God, and giveth life unto the world. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So uh, what man needs is the word of God, right? And so, uh, and, and that will sustain him. Uh, that's what his soul, body, mind, spirit. I mean, that's what that's what man that's what man needs. All right. So we see the words often. We are often are commanded or instructed to eat the word of God. Right. Uh, Matthew chapter four verse four. Another one. But he answered and said unto them, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here we see Jesus speaking again of himself being the word of God that man cannot live by natural bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And what is that that proceeded out of the mouth, mouth of God or came down from heaven or was declared by God? God declared his son, right? The word of God. He declared his word, declared his son, sent his son, sent his word, right? Um, now, the other part of this scripture that we're looking at here that John uh, wrote in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, verse 9, he says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be sweet, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So let's look at this phrase here. We'll get to the bitter part. We're going to start with the sweet part because it starts out in thy mouth. This one's a little different here because most of the scriptures that we're going to read is going to talk about how it starts out to be sweet as honey uh, in the mouth. But here it's kind of reverse. It talks about being uh, bitter in the belly. That's be and I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, I wanted to do it, start with the sweet honey first and end with the bitter, the be uh, belly and the bitter. But because it starts out with, with it saying, eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter. We know it starts in the mouth first and then goes to the belly. But the significance of starting out with the make thy belly bitter part first because that is the volume of what this book represents right we're going to find out what what me, what it means by make thy be belly bitter sounds like a tongue twister here belly bitter is talking about uh the judgments of god right um the hard things that are associated with the word of god or prophesying the words of god things like that. So that is the volume of what this book is about. And that's why it talks about make thy belly bitter first, because that is, that's the hardest part of this, right? That's the volume of what this is talking about. Um, the other parts of the Bible that speak of the mercy of God, the salvation of God, the joy of God, the blessings of God, that's the sweet part. And the vast majority of the, of the whole Bible is really revealing to us the mercy and the compassion and the love of God. And that part is easy to is too easy to proclaim, right? But when we get to things like the book of Revelation, these things more are dealing with the, that bitter part, that judgment part, uh, that um, uh, the hard things to both proclaim and the punishment that comes with that teaching that those prophecies or that word and stuff like that, right? So, uh, but we're going to just first deal with the uh, thy mouth sweet as honey. It shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey first. And then we'll go back to make thy belly bitter. But that's the make thy belly bitter is the most is the significant part of what this book is talking about here. That um, the angel uh, representing Christ, which is a representation of Christ, is really trying to let John know that this thing is really about judgments and things like that. And, you know. So anyway, so let's look at in thy mouth sweet as honey. That's speaking of uh, the, how God and Christ are merciful. Their word is merciful, how they're here to bring justice, right? How his word are just, 
um, and that how his word is full of salvation, how his word is easy to proclaim. It's easy to receive. We love hearing how God loves us, will bless us and, and forgive us and all those things. And the word of God does contain those things. And a lot of that is what is in uh, most of the Old and New Testament. But now what John is receiving is more about the bitter belly part. So when we look at Psalms chapter 19, verse 9 through 10, it talks about the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So here we see that we're talking about how uh, the fear of the Lord is clean. Right. So uh, those that all the good things about how when you when you fear the Lord and you serve him, uh, you don't have to worry about any any anything that's bad. Uh, the Lord is enduring forever. He'll show you mercy. Right. And all of his judgments will be true and righteous. Like like he will be for you, not against you, things like that. So that is like all of those are the good things about the word of God. So that is like sweeter than a honeycomb. Was that sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb? So and they are more to be desired. That's what we want. That's what we enjoy, right? That's what draws people to Christ, the love of God, the mercy of God, the goodness, you know, things like that. Um, and so uh, there is that in, in the book that um, John is receiving. And the book of Revelation reveals that as well, especially when you get toward the end part of this, you know, all of the good things, the just that comes out, those that serve the Lord and, um, uh, repented and things like that, I think we're going to be in a great place, a new heaven, a new earth and stuff like that. And we're going to see that as we read the rest of this, how he's going to take a read. He's going to measure um, uh, a city and stuff like that. You know, it's beautiful, right? Proverbs chapter 24, speaking of in thy mouth, sweet as honey. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 13 through 14, it says, my son, eat thou honey because it is good and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward and thy expectation shall not be cut off. So again, the things, the, the sweet and honey things that are in thy mouth the, that pertain to the word of God are all those things that relate to receiving the knowledge and wisdom of God, right? Um, and it, uh, it's, you know, we want to receive that unto our soul. All the good things that the Lord tells us to do, uh, to obey, to follow after how he will bless us, to receive the wisdom and walk in the wisdom and knowledge of God. Those things are the sweet things. And when we do that, we receive a reward, right? That's what he says. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward and thy expectation shall not be cut off. So that means you have long life. He'll bless you. He'll prosper you. Those are the sweet things. And today's church, that's all we ever want to hear are all the things that are sweet as honey in our mouths that deals with rewards and how our expectations shall not be cut off or anything that we desire, we want from the Lord, when we walk in his wisdom and his knowledge, how he will bless us and prosper us. And he's not necessarily just talking about the natural things, but just the spiritual things, just health and peace, you know, and, uh, and walking in uh, protection and safety and things like that, all right? So the, the things that are sweet as honey, talking about the wit represents the knowledge and the wisdom of the word of god right which is all that is good in christ right all that is good and blessed is in the son of god jesus said on the mountain of uh, olive and he gave this thing about blessed are those that hung after righteousness blessed are those that do this blessed are those that do that blessed are those just all right those are that's the wisdom and knowledge and uh, it's sweet as honey. It fills thy soul and it comes with lots of rewards. And if you do those things, you will buy forever, right? Blessed are the meek of the, blessed are the meek, but they shall inherit the earth. He just goes on and on and on. We love that kind of stuff, right? Uh, he goes on. There's a, in Psalms chapter 19, verse 9 through 10. Oh, did I duplicate that? I think I never went the wrong way. Oh, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24, it says, pleasant are... Pleasant words are as a honeycomb and honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bone. So here again, we see um, all of the word of God that deals with the blessings of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. Those things are what we call the word of God that comes with like that. That is the sweetness uh, and as honey uh, to the soul, right? It makes the soul feel good. It encourages the soul. It builds up the, the um 
us. The soul is the is our true individual, not what's on the outside, but who we really are. It builds us up mentally. It just it strengthens us to stand and to endure and things like that against this wicked and evil world and all the challenges that comes along. It's good to have uh, words that are sweet as honeycomb to the soul, right? I'm sure Zanola right now on Monday enjoy, right? They're probably reading the book of Psalms and things like that that are words that talk about, well, or maybe not, but people are sharing with them or they're meditating on the good things about and what Paul, what uh, David wrote about in the book of Psalms, how the Lord is a refuge and a strong tower. And to those that call upon him, he comes to them quickly. You know, all those great things. That is like sweet as honey to the soul. It's sweet. It strengthens you. It encourages you. It's health to the bones. That's what we, that's what we need, right? The book of Psalms continues on in the same thing. Psalms chapter 19, uh, verse 102 and 103. I have not departed from my judgments, but thou hast taught me. Verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So all the word of God is sweet in the mouth, especially those words that deal with blessings and safety and mercy and love and health and things like that. And even justice, right? Justice is sweet when the Lord brings words of justice, right? David always wrote about how the Lord will defend him against his enemy and will destroy his enemies, right? That's uh, that's sweet. Justice is sweet. Mercy is sweet. Grace is sweet. Salvation is sweet, right? I think I've kind of killed it. <laughs> My wife's saying, yes, you killed it. All right. So now let's look at that bitter part, right? <laughs> My wife's like, oh, no. All right. All right. So that, the, the bitter part of that, when he says he took that word and at first it says, well, make thy belly bitter, right? This make thy belly bitter is associated with all the troubles that are associated in the world, especially associated with the word or bringing the word or being associated with the word or following the word. It comes with trials and tribulations and sufferings. And uh, often the word brings words of judgment and punishment and things like that. Proclamations against people, stuff like that. And that causes the world or people to fight against you, turn against you, even try to kill you, <laughs> throw you in a pit. Like so, they did some of the prophets of old. So that's the that's that part that that is bitter. It's the bitter part, right? When you're just dealing with people that are just evil, wicked, won't repent, right? That's the bitter part. When you have to give judgments or give that word to people um, who don't love God, don't love the word. That's the bitter part that comes with it, and usually it comes with having to deliver to those unrepentant, hard-hearted, stiff-necked individuals words of uh, judgment against them, all right? There's an example uh, in, in the book of, of Ruth, uh, chapter one, verse 19 to 20. Many of you guys know the story of Naomi, so I'm not gonna go and give the background into this as well. But uh, in Ruth chapter one, verse 19, 19 through 20, it says, speaking of uh, this account here, it says, and she came unto them, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi. This is Naomi, she's going through some some, hardships in her life and stuff like that. She says, call me not Naomi, call me uh, Mara, for the Almighty have dealt with me bitterly, right? Uh, and she goes on, verse 21 says, and I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty, right? So she said she went out someplace or whatever, and she was good. And now she's come back. She's coming back, I think, to Bethlehem or something like that um, in the context of this, this chapter here. She's coming back to Bethlehem. She went out, and now she's coming back to Bethlehem. She don't have anything or whatever, right? And, uh, and she's associating all the hardships that has come in her life, right? Um, and she has fellowship with the Lord, but her life has been just hard. She's run into some hardships, so and she's calling that bitterness, right? She says, uh, "I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again, uh, home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me?" So there's afflictions that come with with the fellowship of Christ. There's affliction that comes with carrying out His word, or just being a part of of the family of God, there is a testing and there is a trial, there is an obedience and often with obeying, obeying the word and things like that, there is some bitterness or hardships or sufferings that come along with it. Now this word, he, when she said, uh, call me not Naomi, but call me Mara. When you look up that word Mara, it means bitterness, 
right? It's the same word that means Mary. When you look up, you were to type into Google and it says, what's the Hebrew meaning for the word Mary, right? This word Mara is actually means Mary. I'm pronouncing it Mara, Mara but uh, in the Hebrew language, it would actually mean Mary, right? It just means bitterness, right? And so the word Mary means bitterness or bitter and things like that. So when you go back, um, it's kind of like off topic, but I just want to bring it in anyway. When, when you go back and you look in the, uh, in the book of so the four gospels, right? And wherever there's Mary, Jesus was always was surrounded by Marys, always surrounded by Marys, right? And then when you once you realize that Mary just means bitterness, and then you look at these women, right? These women were uh, really suffering a lot. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 25, it says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cephas, and Mary Magdalene. So he had a bunch of Marys that were always <laughs> surrounding him, right? These were the, the word of God is associated with bitterness. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, the word of God is filled with bitterness in his life. Just carrying the gospel, preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, it comes with bitterness. You cannot escape that. Now, that's why we're saying when with the word comes sweet as honey, but with the word is going to come bitterness as well, right? And that is what we have to accept in this life of Christ and our fellowship of the sufferings, right? We say we want to be with Christ, be like him, be conformed to his image, stuff like that. Well, that comes with the sweet as honey, and it also comes with the bitterness as well. And a lot of us are experiencing the bitterness that comes with, but that's just part of the testing. That's part of the walk of Christ. That's part of the... Uh, of us con conforming, uh, separating us out, letting us know where we want to be. We want to be with the world. We want to be with Christ. We want to, we're going to suffer in the world. We're going to suffer in the world, but we'd rather suffer with Christ because there comes great rewards with that in the end, right? And so we see these Marys, right? They suffered bitterness, but they attached themselves to Christ. And with that, of course, come, came victory, uh, came uh, Christ healing them, restoring them, lifting them up. You know, when you read the stories of these women, how, you know, he met these women and stuff like that. Uh, look at John uh, chapter 20, verse 11. Uh, but Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. We just read these recently. We're just dealing with the uh, resurrection of Christ, which I have not gotten around to doing what I said I was going to do in a group. We're looking at the, the chronology of the timeline of Christ's resurrection, all the events associated with it. I keep saying, I'm going to go back and do it in every resurrection. <laughs> you read it again, you're like, I'm going to need to sit down and put this timeline together. But here again, we see the association of Mary, and we know that means bitterness, that these are women that are associated with the word that dealt with the sufferings of Christ, that identified with the sufferings of the word of God, right? And so uh, another one in Job chapter 3, verse 20 says, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and the life and life unto the bitter in soul, right? So here we see how um, the word, the light of God, the truth of God, right? With that um, association, when there is misery, that light there is there to help us, to guide us, right? Uh, with uh, our life, the life with our with our bitterness that we have in our life as well. The word of God is given to us to help us with the bitterness in our life that we deal with. So uh, you cannot have one without the other. And when you do have bitterness, then you also have Christ that will give you life. Christ that will uh, lift up your soul from the bitter things that are in this world. And I, I hope that's making sense. So it's kind of like uh, vice versa. It goes both ways, right? Uh, you want to have Christ because he helps you get through the bitter things in life, right? But with Christ comes bitter things in life as well, but also comes the sweet things as well. So sometimes in this world, you can only have bitterness. And that's what, at least in this life that we have in Christ, we can have both, right? Uh, and both end up being a blessing. All right. So in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, I'm just going to maybe read one or two more and then, and then we'll um, uh, continue on. It says, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter. For thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. So here we see something that's, a, that's associating with bitterness, 
but it's associating bitterness with evil individuals. So people who are wicked, that's what Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 19 is talking about, right? Uh, that there are people that are wicked, there are people that are backsliding, uh, that will give you all kinds of hardship, right? Um, that have forsaken the word of God. They have no fear of God. They will um, uh, their life is a life of bitterness. Everything associated with them is evil and bitterness altogether. So when you have to go out and teach the, teach the word to them, preach the word to them, these people are filled 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 with evilness and bitterness, and that's because they they are wicked. Right. Uh, they are backsliding. Right. They don't receive reproof. They don't receive correction or anything like that. Right. They have no fear of God in them whatsoever. They're, everything associated with that scenario is filled with bitterness. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 24 says they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents and dust. So uh, bitterness is also, as it relates to the word of God, it also speaks of the judgment that's to come against the evil and wicked individuals, right? So when uh, when John says he ate the word, he put it in his mouth with sweet as honey, but in his belly, it, it made his belly, belly bitter because the part of the word that he has to deliver is the bitter judgment of destruction that's going to come against evil evildoers, workers of, of iniquity and things like that. That judgment that's going to come upon them that he has to digest and break down and then also proclaim and preach is a is a is a judgment of bitter destruction that's going to come upon the evil ev evil workers. I mean, evil workers. And that's what when we look at the book of Revelation, we look at the things that are prophesied, he's having to prophesy all of the bitter destruction uh, judgment that is going to come upon those who eventually, as we move on from this, this little break here, once we get beyond chapters 14, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, is just all this judgment and judgment and judgment. And it's already starting now when we did, you know, the first six trumpets, it was like an escalating punishment and judgment. Well, once we get to the third woe, I mean, that's just it. I mean, there's, that's it. There's no more salvation or anything like that. It's just the final end of the mystery of God. He's just killing everything, destroying everything, um, you know, destroying everything. Right. So part of this, this judgment, part of this bitterness of the word that he's receiving in this book is the bitter destruction and judgment that God is going to bring upon those that continue to reject the word of God. And he's going to have to digest that. And he's going to have to proclaim that. And that's a hard thing to often do because the wicked people, they're just going to fight you over that. You know, they're just so evil, full of this. They just gonna give you a heart. As soon as you stand up to open your mouth, well, you know, they're going to destroy you. And it's getting worse and worse now. I mean, you can barely even say anything on, I mean, people not even say anything bad, but I've watched people on TV just say something like, you know, something innocuous or just minor, and, you know, say, well, that's wrong. You know, like, what do you mean that's wrong? And they kill them and they basically try to, uh, shut them out from, they fire them, they lose their jobs, they can't be on Facebook, or they, they ban them from television, ban them from social media. I mean, you know, it, and they haven't really, they said something minor, like, um, I think it's okay to, uh, I'm a heterosexual male or something like that, you know? And, you know, they're like, you're evil for saying something like that. I'm just making something up that should show you, like, just how simple something can be today's world climate. And people get upset about you saying something as simple as, you know, uh, I want to re I want to remain a virgin until I get married. And I, this is an actual example. And people have destroyed people for saying something as simple as that, you know, making a decision that I, I'm going to wait till marriage before I have kids or something, you know, and boom, people will destroy them and kick them off the television show or stuff like that. All right. So anyway. Um, what time is it here? Oh, anyway, uh, verse 11 says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. All right, so notice the order here that he was instructed to take the book, right, and to eat the book and digest the book, right? And it, was, it, it wasn't just enough for John, because remember when this thing first started out, John was given instructions to 
he was told to write, or maybe said start out like see, see these things, write these things, right, uh, and know what's going on. So it's not enough to see and to write and to know, right? It's not enough for you just to hear me teaching these things or to see these things that are going on or being written about in the Bible. That's not enough. That's never enough. You have to, you have to digest this. You have to assimilate it. It has to become in you, a part of you. You have to eat this, right? Jesus said, take and eat my word, right? If you don't eat my word, there's no life in you. There's no salvation in you. There, there will be no good outcome. If this word isn't in you, you just can't see it. You just can't hear it. You just can't write it down. You just can't have a knowledge of it. You have to partake of it and put it inside you and let it bring about change and nourishment right to your body. So John, before John was able to prophesy these things, right, effectively and with power, right, he had to digest it. He had to eat it, right? That's why we're called to desire as young babes the sincere milk of the word of God, right? You have to begin in order to bring about the change and to growth and become powerful and to fulfill the word of God and the purpose of God, you have to digest it, right? In order to bring about that power and change and victory and overcoming, right? So a lot of people are not over. What John was going to face when he went out to preach this word, right? It was going to be great. Well, he already suffered great things for teaching and preaching who the son of God was, standing on Jesus Christ as the son of God. But as he goes out to teach these things here and the world's going to be upset, He's not, it's going to have to be more than just a head knowledge. It's going to have to be more than just, oh, I wrote these things down. Here it is. And, you know, it has to be inside of him digested. And even for us as the members of the body of Christ, it's not enough for you to know who Jesus is by, by, oh, quoting scriptures or, or, you know, knowing the historical account or anything like that, uh, or that you've read it so many times because it's been written down. It has to be more than that, right? So John was only able to prophesy after he had eaten it. Right. Um, but even after eating all this stuff and the Lord called him out that he must prophesy these things again before many people, he says, for many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. So um, that's why this is very important, because he had to go before kings. Right. And this word is to go before kings. Right. We are to preach this gospel, the book of Revelation. This gospel is to go out to everybody. Right? This is part of the final mystery of God or the fulfillment of things is that this gospel has to go out revealing these judgments that are to come upon the earth. And pretty much and far, almost the whole world knows about the book of Revelation. They know they've heard about the four apostles of the horsemen. They know about these demons coming up from the earth and stuff like that. They may try to present it as aliens coming down and stuff like that or whatever. When you look at it, you're like, man, these things are, are demons, whatever. But they know there's all these movies come up that are out talking about the end of the world, uh, the end of, you know, they know that it, this is going to come to an end, right? Because these prophecies have gone out, you know, to many people. So the whole world has to hear the book of Revelation, has to be preached. And so this book must be better understood by the fivefold ministers and by laymen as well. Uh, the fivefold ministers are just the vehicles that the gospel is explained and better understood uh, to the laymen. And then the laymen are to understand it. And then they are to also be able to 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 uh, warn and to reveal right the plan of God uh, through Christ Jesus and the judgments that are to come and the love of God you know things like that and so but it's to go to many people it's to cover all nations right not just you know Europe or America and stuff like that this gospel here the book of Revelation all its judgments and all the salvation plan of God is to cover every tongue every nation every people and kings the presidents are supposed to know it everybody's supposed to know it right and that is part of this plan here for this gospel here um but the reality of the futility of man is nothing but bitter right um because man is not going to receive it this word as the scripture says many will be saved but many many will not so the the reality of the futility of man is bitter. His end is just going to be what we're going to what we're going to read when we finish up through uh, chapters ten through fourteen, and we get back in chapter fifteen. That his end is just going to be very bitter. It's just going to be judgment upon judgment upon death upon death, and they will not uh, hear the word of God. Uh, they will not repent and things like that. 
What man calls achievement and civilization is nothing more than just rebellion and apostasy, right? That's why man's end is going to be nothing but just bitterness because everything that he thinks is achievement and civilization is nothing but just rebellion and utter apostasy and blasphemy against God and toward God. I mean, look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. It says, thy words were found and I did eat them and thy words and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So we are called to eat the word of God, right? We are called to rejoice and have joy in the word of God, right? Um, but Ezekiel chapter two, verse seven through 10 goes on to say, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. For they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be thou not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. When I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me. Lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me and in it, and it was written within and without and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So the word of God that's coming, as we see in the book of Revelation here, uh, is a word that's coming to a house of rebellious people, right? But he has to eat those words of judgment that God is going to send to the rebellious house. He has to take that in. He has to eat that. You know, he has to open his mouth. He has to eat what God is going to give him. John has to do the same thing here in the book of Revelation. He has to take it. He has to eat those words of judgments that are going to come. And those judgments that are going to come or the word that's going to come uh, against the rebellious house are bitter words. And written, and notice here how he says in verse 10, it says it's written within and without. There's so many judgments and woes and mournings and lamentations that are coming against the rebellious individuals here in the world. And as we're going to see poured out, already being poured out, but even pour it out even more as we start uh, Revelation chapter 15. So many of, of lamentations with an S on it and mourning and woe, right? That woe, is it one woe? There are three woes, but there's that last woe. That last woe is full of lamentations and mournings and just the ultimate bitterness. But it has to come forth, all right? So I'm going to end right there. You ended up kind of early, which is good. Uh, next, uh, tomorrow, we will start with Revelation chapter 11. Let me just check one more thing here. Yes. Uh, any comments or questions?